Welcome. I am Lou Ignaro, Nobel Laureate in Medicine and Chair of the Scientific Committee on Dialogues Beyond Borders, presented by the Mediterranean International Foundation. Today, I am most pleased to present our interview with Professor Marla Sokolovsky, who is a university professor in the Departments of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto in Canada. She has reshaped fundamental concepts in behavioral evolution through her discovery of the foraging gene, which regulates normal individual differences in behavior. Professor Sakolowski has applied her work to early childhood development, demonstrating how children at risk benefit from nutritional, educational, and emotional interventions. In this interview, Professor Sokolowski will talk about this influence of epigenetics on childhood development. I hope you enjoy this interview. Welcome, Marla Sokolowski, University Professor in Department of uh, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at University of Toronto, Canada. This is Dialogues Beyond Borders. It's a, a project organized by Fondazione Internazionale Menarini. And we are going to talk uh, about perspectives of science, but also limits and boundaries of uh, research. First of all, let's start with a personal question. So, uh, why did you uh, choose to, to, to become a scientist? I've always really liked to watch the natural world. I remember as a very small girl going to the creek near my house with a bucket to collect animals and insects and, and watching things. And when I was in school, I really liked mathematics and science. I wasn't very good in languages, and so you drift towards what you enjoy. Neither of my parents had the opportunity to go to university. We were encouraged to work hard, do well. Uh, I came from a family that didn't have a lot of opportunities, and so I loved studying. My mother was a kindergarten teacher, and the big game was learning how to spell words and do math and wherever I was. And so, and my father, although he only had a grade five education coming from Europe um, at a hard time, he loved to read and we always talked about ideas at the dinner table. So I knew that I loved thinking about ideas and that I wanted to have a life where I could always learn from a pretty young age. And now you deal with behavior, which is a very huge area. So how can we define behavior? What's in, it, in this world? So I really like complicated problems. You know, some people like to get right down to the detail and they're not comfortable with complexity. But I knew when I took courses in animal behavior and genetics that I liked complication. I liked working at the edges of different disciplines, bringing people together who wouldn't normally find themselves in the same room, who had different vocabularies and different ways of thinking to address complicated problems. And so behavior must be one of the most complicated problems in terms of asking why are we all different? How do you define it in a very general sense is really any activity or inactivity, even being silent and sitting there silently is you can measure that as a behavior. And so that's what I would call behavior, some type of activity or inactivity. And you can measure it, you can count how long I might say you're being quiet. You can look at when I decided to start to be quiet, um, how often I'm quiet. That's just a, a simple example. But things like learning and remembering our behavior, our patterns of behavior during sleep, um, competition for mates. There's many really fascinating um, behaviors that one can study. So I love those courses. I love looking at the animal world and that's how I, I landed in it. And it was a great fit for me. And why do we behave this way or that way? Uh, where do individual differences come from? That's what I've been studying for the last 40 years. That's my main, been my main question. And I started it with an approach in a field called behavior genetics. So it looks at individual differences, where they come from during development, 
and how genetics or our genes contribute to them. And originally people thought it's either nature or it's nurture. You're born as a blueprint and you're gonna behave like this all the time. That's genetic determinism. Or you're born as a blank slate and the environment writes on it. Your experience writes on that blank slate and you develop and that goes, you know, hundreds of years, people thought one way or the other way. But we know that it's more complicated than that and my group has shown it's not even more complicated, it's more interesting. That you can't just add together, well, this amount comes from your genes and this amount comes from your environment. In fact, it's an interaction. And what I mean by that is your genes give you a predisposition or a probability of behaving a certain way and your experience can modify it. So I may have a gene that um, changes my probability of okay, being sensitive to my infant baby, let's say. I might be a highly sensitive person, but depending on my early experience, which could be very positive, for instance, or adverse, that will change my predisposition to have a high sensitivity towards my my young infant. So my genes might predispose to me, but the environment can modify it. And in the fruit flies that I spent most of my time studying, the environment can completely modify your genetic predisposition. It can even almost override it. And so we went from nature, nurture, nature or nurture, to adding them together, to talking about them interacting. And the modern way of thinking of it now, um, from my work and others, is what we like to call an interplay between genes and the environment. The genes, the DNA sequence, is listening to the environment that it is experiencing. And the environmental modification, it can be the physical environment that we have, our community, our socioeconomic status. It can even be our social environment, like the social experiences that we have. Our genes respond to those different environments and they respond to that environment by making their gene products, RNA or protein, by putting those gene products in my brain or in my gut at certain times during development. And so it's not that there's a genetic blueprint that makes you one way or the other determining things. It's a, a play, an interplay between them. And this, this conference we're at now is on epigenetics, and it is the process by which the genes get regulated where that information from the environment can come in and modify the amount of gene product or protein that's made uh, at a certain time, where it goes in the body, when it gets made, all kinds of interesting things. And when these things go awry, you can get disorder and disease as well. So indi individual differences, why we're all different in terms of behavior is um, has to do with this gene environment interplay and epigenetics has a role in that. Having understand that, do you think that it's possible to predict someone's behavior? I think you can't predict anything 100%, but I could say that if you have a long family history, let's say a bipolar disorder, um, and you grow up in a certain environment that makes you more at risk, I could say that you have a higher probability of having bipolar disorder. So whenever we talk about behavior and many traits, most traits are complicated. Most traits have many genes involved, almost all. We're talking about chances, probabilities, and the public has a bit of trouble with that, and scientists too. They want to know 100% is it this or is it that, but really it is about probability or risk, right? And so when you go to your doctor, if they're going to tell you for sure you're going to have this trouble, then they're not explaining it in the way that it really should be. It's like you're in, by smoking, you for this many years, this many packs a day, you are increasing your risk by this much if you're male or female, for cancer, lung cancer, let's say. Uh, talking to uh, about genetics, um, you discovered a uh, foraging gene. Uh, what is its role in, in an animal behavior, but right. also in human behavior? Right, so when I was a, a student, a third year in university, I looked at fruit flies and I noticed that the maggot, the little worm sage, some of them move a lot when they eat, and some of them stay still and eat. And I found that this also was found in nature, and I called the one that moves a lot, Rover, keeps on moving, and the sitter is the name I gave for the one that stays. And we did 
genetic analyses to ask what's involved. And we found a number of genes involved, but one of them had a big effect on the behavior. So if you had this form of the gene or this allele, you would be rover. And if you had the other form, you would be sitter. And you could genetically make flies of different types. And with techniques nowadays, we can put more of the gene in or take some away or edit it with CRISPR, this way to edit. You could do a lot of fruit flies, it's pretty fun. Anyways, so that really was of interest to the, I forgot what your question was now, but that was... Now, what, what do you see right role? About? Okay, so that gene, we cloned it after doing all the genetic work and behavior work and showed that it's what they call a signaling molecule, a kinase. And it's very interesting because it acts in many places in the body, affecting many things, it turns out. It doesn't just affect foraging behavior, it affects how you learn and remember if you're a fly, how fat you get if you're a fly, a mouse, a human, how you forage if you're a fly or a human, what else, stress responses, and it acts in different places to accomplish those things. So for the fly, in terms of that behavior I told you about being a rover or a sitter forager, it's in certain cells in the brain that are, if you have more of that, that enzyme that, that makes that foraging gene, you're gonna be rover. If you have less in those places in the brain, you're going to be sitter. In terms of being fat, having a lot of uh, fat tissue if you're a fly, also humans and mice, if you have more of the gene, you're more lean. And if you have less in the fat tissue, you have higher obesity. And so where it acts matters and how much of the gene product is made matters. So it's a really interesting gene to, to talk about because we know that genes can have more than one effect. Like in the public, people like to say, oh, there's a gene for this or there's a gene for that. But many individual genes do many things. So this functions also in the heart um, and keeping your muscles, you know, with your heart beating. And in order to know what it does and what effect it might have, for instance, on behavior, you have to be able to dissect it and control where you're changing the amount of the gene, where you might change the DNA sequence and in, in what cells. And um, you can also give the flies um, poor nutrition in early life and change a rover into a sitter. And so you can modify the behavior and the expression of that gene by giving them experiences. Social experiences change them. If you isolate the fly, they will be affected differently when they go and have a party with other flies. So you can really study this gene environment interplay in terms of the behavior and the metabolic, the metabolism, and also at the level of that gene. What, what's happening is epi, our epigenetic modifications coming in and changing it. And we know that the difference in the adult foraging behavior how much you weigh around a dish and how much any food drops you find has to do with epigenetics. And so there's a little tag that is put on, it's called a histone, the DNA sequence get, gets wrapped around it. And if you have that tag, the gene is not expressed a lot. You have less RNA and if you don't, you have more RNA. And that explains the difference in rhombocytor behavior in the animal fly in the dish. So it's a great system to look at. In terms of humans, all we've done with this um, is look at human foraging behavior. Um, we have students, hundreds of students, sit down at computers. This is with a, a psychology professor, um, James Dankert, and a woman professor, um, Abby Scholler, at University of Waterloo. Actually, the way this started is that there's personality traits of humans. They taught me this. Some people are assessors, so they sit around and they evaluate all the information in the environment and then collecting they don't act quickly they're collect information and then they make a decision it's like my husband deciding we're going to get a new tb right he investigates everything and then eventually months later we buy a tv and with me i would have looked at this and that and bought a tv so the assessor is the one who collects information and the locomotor is the other personality type that's always on the move and so you're it's not just that you're physically on the move but your mind is on the move and you can evaluate that in humans by giving them questionnaires. And that's done with university students in these studies that we did, where you looked at how many drug stores or grocery stores did kids go to, um, how much time did they spend partying, having dates, um, 
on the on exercise equipment and how much time did they sit and and you can get a score of being a locomotor or an assessor and then when you take a human foraging gene because humans have it too you can find a genetic alteration in it and it's associated with your tendency to be more of a locomotor or an assessor and then when you take those people and you give them this uh, foraging assay where they're sitting in front of a computer sorry i have to backtrack and it, the little balls of of cherries come chip through the screen you know and you're poking you as soon as you see a cherry drop you hit it and they come from all over you find that the, their search strategies for how they look for these cherries is the same as my fruit flies. So the assessors go all around the edge and then they come in to grab it. Just like our fruit flies, will, the sitters will be around the edge and then they go in and grab some sugar and come back. But the, the rovers always go into the middle, search around. And so the two, the human type is the locomotor is is some of them are going like this, some are going in the middle, but the assessor is like our center flies that is always tight around the edge and then coming and grabbing something. And you could imagine if there was a predator, a jumping spider or something in the dish with the fly, there would be, it would be adaptive to keep hiding around the edge and only take a chance to come in the middle. So it depends on the environment. Anyway, so we did the genetics on humans it found again that there was an association, a probability that if you had one form of that human foraging gene, you would be more locomotor and one more assessor. And it was correlated to the choosing fruit, pretend fruit in the screening. But and there is a balance between the two behavior yeah. because there, it, it must be uh, an evolutionary history behind it because probably they are both useful for the, the, the human kind. Right. So when I first did this work, my training was in evolutionary biology and I said, why do we have both types? Why can we not just have one individual who can do everything, you know, and keep switching? And so we studied that in two ways and by changing the environment. And one of them was to rear flies in a very dense situation, very crowded. And the other was not crowded at all. And we could change the frequency of the types and the at the genetic level so the real crowded in, environment selected for the rover that would move out and the less crowded environment selected for sitters it maybe they didn't waste energy and locomotion and when you put them together different combinations of rover and sitter you find that when you are the least frequent you have a fitness advantage you do better so if there's 10% sitters and 8 and 90% rovers, the sitters will have more babies than the rovers. But if it's reversed, there's 10% rovers and 90% sitters, then the rovers have an advantage. So whenever you are the unusual one in that population, you do better. We don't know why. And so that keeps that variant or that form in the population because just by being rare alone, it has more babies. So that, those are evolutionary mechanisms for how it is that they both might exist. And in humans, I'm sure it's very, there's a ton of overlap. And obviously, a locomotor and assessor is not the only way that you can, quotes, cat categorize individuals, but there's a tendency for us to be different in that regard. And this gene seems to play some kind of role. It's only an association. It's been replicated a few times and we need to do more work, but it's a fun, a fun story. I, I think I'll just leave it at that with the human one. <laughs> okay. That's very fascinating. Women in science, because uh, do you think that we need more women in uh, STM? So when I started, I was going to go into physics and math. And when I went to the university, it was so uh, unhospitable for women in those labs and in the classes that I moved to biology and I found it a home there. I was the first professor who was a woman. I wasn't hired on real money. I had to compete for that job. And in the interview, they asked me if I'm gonna have children and quit. You know, I experienced all those stories that young women hear about, and it's much better than it was, but there's still difficulties. There aren't a lot of senior women. We need diversity in our, our in what we do, in science, in policy, everywhere. And when you have a diverse series of opinions and backgrounds and history, you bring that unique perspective to a problem. And so my lab 
is always made up of people from all over the world, different races, different backgrounds, many women, also men. And when we have a problem, it's much richer discussion. And when the problem is challenging, we together in a nurturing way, a collaborative way, can make strides that change paradigms. It's, it's very easy to think you're right when everyone around you thinks the same. You can think you're absolutely certain because everyone that you surround yourself with has the exact same opinion and that you're not going to push boundaries if that's the case. And then women have, I think on average, different ways to have their lab or mentor the, their students. And it isn't that there's no men that nurture, there's many men that nurture, but on average, I think women tend to be in a lab environment, have a more nurturing lab. And I just won this, I'm going to brag a little bit. I just won this award for nurturing at the, for mentoring at the university. And it was so fun after so many years to read the testimonies of the students and how I made a difference in their life supervising them and the projects and interacting. And there was a lot of being a role model, having two children, you know, the same husband for over 50 years, this kind of thing that they saw it's possible to do this, right? And it's like a family when my daughter was tiny and I had to teach at night and she was in the daycare at the university, my students went and got her and, and entertained her, right? So we helped each other. And so it's helpful to, to see it can happen. The project is called uh, Dialogues Beyond Borders. So do you think that science, and in particular uh, your research areas, needs to have uh, boundaries not to, to be crossed over? So behavior genetics has a, a tough history, and I never called myself a behavior geneticist until recently. I always said I work in genes and behavior <laughs> um, because it, it was used for eugenic purposes. Um, even in Canada with the indigenous population, the Nazis had thought about eugenics, genocides. The idea behind it being is that that group of people are like that, period. It's not to do with their lack of privilege. It, it's a deterministic point of view. We're going to weed out that group. We're going to sterilize these women. In a way, when that research gets in the hands of people who already have those opinions, it, it can be misused and it is misused. And so scientists need to speak out, but we also have to be very careful with how we word and explain things. And the press, I know you're part of the press, but some of the press and some of the public, they really want clear cut answers and industry does too. If you can tell me a hundred percent that this is true, then I'll write about it, or then I'll, I'll be interested. And the world just doesn't work that way. And I think our young people are not trained to think of probabilities. We would train- and complexity. Yeah, we train black and white, it's this or it's not, uh, it's not. So I think it, it's, a, but at the same time, I don't think we should be saying you can't do research in that because that we can't restrict um, communication and thought either. But I think we have to be very careful how this kind of work is used. And I personally work on fruit flies and my colleagues who I collaborate with work on mice and humans. I like the flies. I don't have to feel badly if I have to kill them or, you know, and the ethics required are less but uh, so far. But I think um, the ethics of animal research is very important. And also we do gene editing in the lab with CRISPR. CRISPR on our flies, but of course, the more you find, then it gets used in other ways. And technology is running so fast and the use of AI and CRISPR and many of these things that we need to always have bioethicists with us trying to look forward. And then, you know, the algorithms of these big populations, that big corporations. So I think we're in need of ethicists and bioethics and really sitting and thinking about what can this what can happen with this work? It's a difficult problem. Thank you, Professor Sokolowski. Thank you. Okay, my pleasure.